Welcome everyone to Buddha's Center. So wonderful we can all be together today and look at Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment. This beautiful text that illuminates all the stages of the path to enlightenment that we will need uh, in order to achieve the goal that I would assume we all have in our lives, generally speaking, when we look at how our minds work, and that's to not have to suffer and have as much happiness as possible. And most of the time in our lives, we go through various procedures uh, to accomplish those two goals, freedom from suffering and complete happiness. And the things that we do to make that occur, for some reason or another, over and over and over again, uh, doesn't produce the result that we're looking for. And what's so fortunate about today is we're talking about techniques, we're talking about causes, uh, that we can create in our lives to actually produce those results that we crave so much. Uh, and by uh, engaging in the pathway that is required to produce those results, uh, we then uh, start to learn how to love others more and more and more to the point where we you know, put their, their happiness before our own. We start to you know, have compassion for others more and more and more. And we start to think about putting their uh, freedom from suffering before our own freedom from suffering. Uh, because we recognize that the only way for us to truly achieve all of our own aims uh, is to relate in this way to all sentient beings and learn to cherish them more than ourselves. Uh, so before we begin the teaching, uh, we're going to begin by setting a proper motivation. I, from my side of the teacher, is I'm going to begin by setting a proper motivation. And you, from your side of the, as a student, uh, should also set a proper motivation. So by listening to what I say, uh, then you can, uh, you know, put a motivation that aligns with what I say. And then what I'm going to say is from the Sanchi Molam, from the Prayer of Noble Conduct. And that is basically that, you know, may this dharma that I'm teaching be proclaimed in the language of all uh, and be able to be heard and understood in the varieties of speech and be able to be understood in the varieties of aptitudes uh, so that each and every one of those beings that I'm inviting here to be my guest uh, can be able to benefit from it and can be able to be led to the truth of suchness, the truth of reality, uh, in whatever way they need to be. So when we look, when I think about uh, what the object of observation of this kind of motivation will need to be to align with what Buddhas do and to align with what my goals are, uh, I'll see that the object of this kind of thought, when I say the language of all, has to be all sentient beings. So in my mind, I invite all sentient beings, hell, hungry, ghost, animal, human demigods and gods here uh, to be able to listen to this teaching. Uh, and I'm uh, imagining that I have this ability uh, that the higher beings and then the Buddhas ultimately have to be able to just say one thing and answer everyone's question simultaneously that is asked in their own individual language. So I'm imagining that I'm doing this as a teacher so that eventually I can become a bodhisattva and eventually that bodhisattva path will lead to Buddhahood where I actually have these qualities. But by creating a fertile ground in my mind that's similar to this, uh, I start to begin that process of becoming that completely reliable guide that can proclaim this Dharma in the language of all. And because I'm saying that this is what I'm doing uh, and I'm imagining that I can do this, you then imagine that you can act, lead all sentient beings here uh, from your side uh, to be able to hear this dharma. And you know that it's a reliable dharma because A, I've said that it's the great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment that encompasses all the stages of the path that are necessary for beings to mature from whatever state of spirituality they are to the complete state of Buddhahood. And I've not only said that the subject matter is going to be something of such importance, I've said that uh, the beings will be able to understand it. Every single being in the universe will be able to understand it because I'm setting this aspiration, I'm putting out there this idea, I'm imagining that this language that I'm speaking is being converted into 
the language that's needed to be heard by beings in the hell, hungry ghosts, animal, human, demigods, and gods to be able to move forward on their path. And we shouldn't think that they don't have a lot of aptitude because even in the hell realm, Buddha Shakyamuni achieved the mind that aspires to enlightenment, achieved bodhicitta by wanting uh, his companion or someone who was with him and uh, to be free from suffering and, and wanted them to have happiness and, and generated this beautiful mind of bodhicitta in his mind and, and took over this work uh, that the person who uh, was in hell was having to do and suffering so greatly from. Uh, and this generation that happened within uh, in the previous lives of the Buddha's mind uh, um, was the arisal of bodhicitta uh, and then you can read the rest of the story that he was, you know, no longer uh, in the hell realm because suddenly, you know, this beautiful mind arises. Uh, um, so we can see that all beings have this potential uh, to kind of evolve. Uh, and we imagine even if they're abiding in kind of a formless concentration, uh, that they somehow can hear us uh, and they, they, that I, they somehow can hear me. Um, so you're leading all beings in the, in the various realms of cyclic existence, any beings that have afflictive obstructions or obstructions to omniscience here, and you're leading them somewhere. It makes sense to lead them to, and it'll be beneficial to lead them here. Uh, so now I'll recite these, this uh, stanza from the King of Aspiration prayers. Uh, and as I recite this, uh, start to imagine that you're bringing all sentient beings is here as your guests, that you're starting to align your mind with what you'll be able to do. Uh, you'll be able to connect with every sentient being in the universe, and you'll be reliable for them. You'll be able to teach them the truth of suchness. You're here to become the most reliable guide in the universe, to be able to teach the truth of suchness. You're here to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. You're empty of inherent existence. All sentient beings are empty of inherent existence. This thought to become a Buddha for their sake is empty of an inherent existence. But subjectively, conventionally, these things exist uh, and work because of dependent origination. So now I'll recite this stanza. And you start to, as I recite this, and say that I'll proclaim this Dharma in the language of all, imagine that you bring everyone here as your guest, all of these different types of beings, and imagine that you're bringing them here for one reason, and that's for them to evolve to the state of perfection, for them to be able to wake up from the sleep of ignorance, for them to be able to get rid of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience in the same way that you wish to get rid of the afflictive obstructions and the obstructions to omniscience. You equally, you and all sentient beings equally want to have complete freedom from suffering, and that requires removing the afflictive obstructions. You and all sentient beings want the most happiness possible, and that requires removing the obstructions to omniscience. So by removing the afflictive obstructions, we get rid of all of our suffering, and by removing the obstructions to omniscience, we are able to have this state of bliss, complete reliability, uh, perfect wisdom, perfect compassion, perfect love, perfect skillful means, perfect power. Uh, and so forth. Uh, so now I'll recite this. Laike dan lo dan no jing ke dro bon da da mi yi ke nan dan dro wa gon ji jo nan ji san ba dan je ke du da ji ju den do. In the language of gods, nagas, and yaksas, in the language of demons and of humans too, and in however many kinds of speech there may be, I shall proclaim the Dharma in the language of all. And we see there's no bias in that aspiration that we're making. When we gather these sentient beings, we really gather them in terms of the teachings we find in the Lam Rim, the teachings that we find in the mind training texts, where we start with that kind of basis of equanimity, uh, where we arrive at an equal desire, an equal willingness to be of benefit to all sentient beings, those who we consider friends, those who we consider strangers, those who we consider enemies, uh, we see that we have this equal willingness to benefit. Generally speaking, uh, normally, this goes against our grain because normally uh, we would more want to help our friends. Uh, uh, we would want our enemies uh, to a lot of times be harmed. We wouldn't want to help them at all. Uh, and strangers, so-so. We're more likely to help a stranger than we are an enemy, but 
uh, we're less likely to help them than a friend. So we're trying, you know, the 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 Lojung teachings, the Lamrim teachings, uh, you know, the, the seven point cause and effect teachings, the pre step for that. These teach us to kind of reverse this attitude, reverse this idea uh, through a series of meditative practices that I I, I encourage you uh, to look into the seven point cause and effect for realizing the mind that aspires to enlightenment, equalizing, exchanging self with others, where we start to establish this kind of equanimity, a ground of equanimity, where we have an equal willingness uh, to be of benefit. And then in the seven point cause and effect, we see that all sentient beings are mothers. We remember their kindness, wish to repay their kindness, generate a love through the force of this attraction we have towards them, generate great compassion for them. And then an extraordinary attitude that says that I'll take on myself the task of bringing these sentient beings to a state of happiness and freedom from suffering. And then a recognition that comes from that is that handicap that we have at this moment in doing so, and that we must become a Buddha and, and a, one who's awake uh, in order to bring sentient beings to a state of freedom from suffering, a state of happiness, or the equalizing, exchanging self with others practice where we recognize that all sentient beings are equally important uh, and that you know cherishing ourselves has so many downfalls and cherishing others has so many upsides. Uh, and we begin to start to actually actively meditate on, you know, love by giving others happiness and, and compassion by imagining or taking on their suffering. Uh, and then we actually start to imagine we put our others' needs before our own uh, in this process. And we think about the great kindness that each and every one of the sentient beings uh, has shown us uh, in our, our previous lives and the great kindness that they've shown us in terms of how we everything that we have in our lives require other sentient beings. All the good things that we have require innumerable causes and conditions for them to come into being. And many of those require sentient beings who are strangers to us, uh, who we, we can't even imagine uh, the numbers of until we start to think about our cup of coffee and how it actually got here. And we see how kind everyone is to us and how all of these beings play some sort of a role. Even people we may label as our enemy in kind of a childish way, play a role in our being able to be happy. Uh, and then we, in this meditation, then take on ourselves the task of, of freeing these sentient beings from suffering and bring them to happiness and then recognize our handicap and recognize that we must become a Buddha uh, in order to do so. So all of these things that we're doing, these practices that we're doing should be supported by meditations like that so that they have a real meaning to us so that we aren't just kind of uh, doing it like a, a video game that's senseless. We're doing it to try to evolve our mind uh, into something that's more pure, uh, evolve our mind from a self-cherishing state, from a place of selfishness that would never share the gift uh, that we found, the, the most incredible gift in the universe we've been given this idea of how to remove the afflictive obstructions and instructions to omniscience. And normally we're so greedy, we never share gifts with anyone. And now we're kind of breaking this behavior uh, by way of analysis and by way of meditation uh, and seeing that this kind of behavior is so childish because the only way we can really experience happiness is by giving all sentient beings all of our gifts. So we realize we have to become a Buddha for the sake of all sentient beings. So when we're gathering sentient beings here and we're imagining the real beings in our life and the real beings uh, that they know, you know, uh, it's important for us to have this perspective uh, that these bodhicitta practices, the cause and causes for bodhicitta practices bring to our mind well before having bodhicitta. They start to work on our minds in such a way uh, that the affective mind starts to change because this cognitive process that we're going through and trying to understand the real nature of things, beginningless lives, and, you know, the relationship we have with all sentient beings, this kind of cognitive process changes our affective state, changes the way uh, that we feel basically about things, the way that we feel about others. Uh, so this is why we work so hard in analytical meditation uh, when it, in terms of this, so that we can produce this effect of an effective mind <laughs> like bodhicitta. Uh, so this is um, something that, you know, why, why do we do all of this stuff? Why do we do all this imagining? You know, what's the purpose of it? It's to try to kind of reinforce in our mind uh, this idea uh, 
that loving others, having compassion for others is the key to our success. Uh, and others are required for our happiness. Uh, and all others are required for our the most happiness we can have. And there can't be any bias. So as soon as we have bias, we're saying we don't want some bit of happiness. So this is the analysis we come to. As soon as we say, oh, that's an enemy, we say, oh, okay, oh, I'm looking for a little less happiness than I can have. Because you have to want others to have happiness and be free from suffering, you know, and all of them in order to experience the bliss that a Buddha has. So anytime you start to say, this is an enemy, or this is someone I wouldn't benefit even, now you're blowing your shot at a percentage of your happiness. And nobody only wants, you know, like a small percentage of happiness. You want 100% happiness. So every time you aren't relating to a sentient being in a way in which you want them to have happiness and freedom from suffering, you're relating to them in a way which isn't going to cause you to have the most happiness that you can have. So a sign that you are causing future unhappiness is that you have an enemy. Because you can't have the most happiness possible unless you don't have an enemy. Because an enemy, you don't want to have happiness in the causes of happiness. You want them to be harmed. You don't have this kind of non-harm in relation to enemy. They get harmed, great. You don't have this idea that you want them to have your most precious gift. So if you don't have this idea that about someone having your most precious gift, you've now subtracted from your potential. So this is what the, co the cognitive, the analytical meditation does to kind of change the way we feel about everyone and everything. Uh, and the emptiness, the wisdom realizing emptiness helps us to become more realistic with everything and everyone. Uh, but also this other you know, the ripening path that we talk about, liberating paths and ripening paths, this ripening path and this these meditations that we do cause our minds to become more realistic and less, you know, kind of focused on ourselves. And this helps to support our wisdom realizing emptiness. It's very interesting how this kind of less intensity on cherishing yourself helps you to realize emptiness helps you to realize the selflessness of person because you've just gotten a whole bunch of stuff out of the way uh, and you have more room to look at the way things really, really are. And you've cognitively started to move things out of the way that are erroneous. And so you don't have like as much of a hum of distraction going on uh, That because that hum is just a wrong idea. That's what's so loud. This wrong, all these wrong, these permanent, you know, that thing's permanent, unitary, independent, you know, all these wrong ideas create this hum. And the more of them we get away, the quieter our mind becomes. And the quieter our mind becomes, the more likely we are to be able to focus it on something that's very subtle. Uh, so this is what we're doing. So we have all sentient beings here. Uh, and now uh, we're going to do a quick practice together uh, where we just try to calm our minds down a little bit. Uh, and get into a more realistic place. We'll all imagine that we and all sentient beings are in the seven point Vairocana posture. We don't have to imagine, we can get into it. If you can't physically get into it, get into, you know, a, a similitude of it or whatever your normal posture is, but try to keep your back uh, as straight as possible. It says like a stack of coins. Uh, um, so seven point Vairocana posture, imagine you and all sentient beings are doing it. Uh, and we're going to meditate on what we always meditating on, uh, breathing in and out, counting of the breath, and front generation form of Buddha Shakyamuni about an arm length away, about eye height, about the size of our thumb, beautiful and radiant, but static and fixed. Uh, you know, three-dimensional, you know, Buddha. Buddha's there, but Buddha's not moving. <laughs> Buddha's, Buddha's just in single-pointed concentration, and Buddha's not moving, you know, like this kind of image of Buddha. But the real Buddha, uh, you're trying to, when I say the real Buddha, you're trying to imagine it as real, as the picture as real as possible. Let's say it like that. Trying to imagine the picture as real as you can, but fixed. Okay, so we're going to just tell our minds what to do now. 
we normally don't do that. Uh, and Buddhism uh, and the Buddha taught that this is the main thing you got to start trying to do is tell your mind what to do, what to think about it, you know, what to think about, etc. So right now we're going to tell our minds to focus only on breathing in and out, counting in the front generation form of Buddha Shakyamuni. Uh, and if our minds start to misbehave uh, and move away from the breathing in and out, counting in Buddha Shakyamuni, how could they move away? Say they move away by distraction and scattering and excitement. Your mind is going da 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 And it's supposed to just being focused, the mental consciousness, only focusing on this inhalation, exhalation, counting uh, in Buddha Shakyamuni. So there's a bell or a noise, or you thinking about a car going on in your mind, and that's a problem. You know, this is a downfall. This is something that needs to be uh, um, gotten rid of. The other problem that can happen is you get like a darkness or a lack of clarity, a laxity, kind of dull, sleepy, sinking. This needs to be gotten rid of. Uh, so mindfulness is you told your mind what to do. Mindfulness is don't forget, I told you to Breathe and focus your mental consciousness only on breathing in and out, counting in Buddha Shakyamuni. That's it. Uh, so if that's not what's going on, there's a problem. How do you know that's not what's going on? There's a spy in your mind called introspection, vigilance. It's kind of just sitting back, sitting back very quietly, not in the, not in the front row, just sitting back, making sure that mindfulness is doing its job. And if mindfulness loses the object because you start to get sleepy, dull, you know, lights turn off or your mind starts going all over the place, uh, introspection is going to set off an alarm. Mindfulness should grab that object back. So this is how meditation works. And on Thursday nights, we're talking about shamatha, the causes for shamatha, the conditions for shamatha, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we're going to learn a lot more about obstacles to meditation uh, and the antidotes of applying introspection and mindfulness and so forth. So we're not going to go into that anymore. Um, I do a little bit each class just because this is our meditation. This is how we change our minds and we have to know how to do it. So let's focus on that just for a bit uh, and then we'll go from there. Now imagine that Buddha Shakyamuni has been containing the entire merit field. Buddha Shakyamuni now comes alive. And while coming alive, uh, from the bliss that uh, Buddha Shakyamuni is experiencing, uh, always, but also from seeing us uh, here today, engaging in exactly what he came to the world to show us how to do, uh, this bliss erupts into the entire merit field and space in front of you. So now you imagine you see Buddha Shakyamuni uh, alive and smiling, looking into your eyes with such love and compassion, imagining His Holiness the Dalai Lama sitting on a throne, uh, supported by snow lions. Imagine that all the enlightened beings are starting to fill in in the space in front of you. Imagining Kensar Geshe Wandok, knowing how happy that he would be that we're continuing the Lam Rim tradition. Uh, now, not thinking how happy he would be, thinking how happy he is. Imagine he's right there in the space in front of you, right in the room. Kensar Geshe Wandak, your lamas, whoever your lama is, imagine them right in the room. Uh, if they're, if they're uh, um, alive and in this world in physical form, imagining them on a throne. If they are not alive and are not in this physical world, imagining them on lotuses. So imagining His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Kensar Geshe Wandak, Geshe Lopsan Gompo, Kensa Lopsan Jatsa, Demolocha Rinpoche, Geshe Doje Damju, Amzala Geshe Aga, Geshe Malatenzen Ladran, Jeffrey Hopkins, Lama Zopa Rinpoche, Chatter Rinpoche, any beings that you consider holy enlightened beings, have them in the space in front of you. Now imagine the beings of the extensive deeds lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Matrayana Sangha and Vasubandhu and Dignaga and Dharma Kirti and Bhumukta Sena and Haribhadra and Gunaprabha and Shakya Prabha and Lama Salimpa. Uh, and Lord Atisha, imagining all of these holy beings we're so connected to and the extensive deeds lineage in the space in front of you. Now imagine these holy beings from the profound view lineage passed down from Buddha Shakyamuni to Manjushri and Nagarjuna and Buddha Palita and Arya Deva and Chandra Kirti and Chant uh, Shanti Deva and Chandra Rashita and Baba Vega and Kamala Shila 
and, and now again, imagining Lama Salimpa and Lord Atisha, all these holy beings in the space in front of you, imagining the beings of the lineage of blessings passed down from Saraha uh, to Matripa and to Lopa uh, and Naropa and Naropa, Brajadara to Saraha and Matripa and to Lopa and Naropa, Losawa, Marpa and Milarepa and Gampopa, all of these holy beings. Imagining Atisha passing down the Lamrim lineage to Drone Tompa, imagining the three old Kadampa lineages, the beings from the uh, the holy beings of Nyingma lineage, uh, Padma Sambhava, Sakya lineage, Sakya uh, Kunga Nimpo, Sakya Pandita, Kaju lineage, uh, such as the Garmapas, imagining the beings of uh, Galupa lineage, Lama Sankapa, Kirtupje, Jelsupje, Penchen Sanandrapa, Basuchuji Jetsan, Jayan Sheba. Janja Rupi Dorje, Gonju Jimmy Wampo, Jitsumba, Bubajo, all of these holy beings, seventh Dalai Lama in the space in front of you. We're connected to all of these beings that I've mentioned the names of. If we've looked at Lama Tsongkhapa's great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment, as many of us have for so many years when we did with Kensar Geshe Wandaga uh, we've connected to every single one of these beings' names that I've mentioned. We've heard their teachings. Their lineages have been passed to us. They are our spiritual family. We can have a sigh of relief that this family is so pure and we're so lucky to have this family. Now imagine all the beings, the highest yoga tantra, yoga tantra, performance tantra, and action tantra all of the 35 Buddhas, all of the protector beings, small scope protector, medium scope protectors, great scope protectors, Vaisharana, Kala Rupa, Mahakala, Haldan Lama, all of these holy beings protecting us, making sure that we have the Dharma, making sure that the Dharma is protected. Now that all beings in the universe are here, the enlightened beings who have no longer have afflictive obstructions and obstructions to omniscience and other sen and sentient beings, any beings who have anything remaining, even if it's just a little bit of obstructions to omniscience, the subtlest, subtlest obstructions to omniscience. Imagine they're here and they're here to be able to listen to the Dharma that will help them mature to the next stage in their path. So all beings are here, the enlightened beings are here and all the sentient beings are here. With this in mind, we'll recite the Heart Sutra. Can you please screen share? Thank you. Yep. The screen share should be enabled. So this is so important, this Heart Sutra. Um, we've been going over the book by Jeffrey Hopkins, Meditation on Emptiness, and looking at what a non-affirming negative is. What is it that we're trying to negate? What is the object of negation? When it says there is no eye, uh, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, what is this talking about? Is it saying that these things don't exist? No, it's not saying that. It's saying that these things don't exist inherently from their own side. These things can't stand themselves up. Uh, on their own. Uh, and the, the Buddha makes this very, very clear uh, that we aren't talking about a nihilistic view where things don't exist. We're saying that things merely uh, come into being through nominal designation on a basis of designation. And that is the dependent origination. That thought designation on a basis of designation makes the thing exist, but the thing does not exist inherently from its own side. The self of person, self of phenomena, neither exist from their own side autonomously, uh, inherently, uh, right inside the object, uh, intrinsically. All of these things are, are non-existence. A non, uh, a intrinsically existent self of person, inherently existent self of person, a self of person that exists right in the object. Uh, all of these things are non-existent things. Uh, so uh, an I that is inherently existent doesn't exist, but the I exists through dependent origination, uh, through causes and conditions, collections and parts. But really, at the Madhyamaka Prasangika level, the final level of dependent origination is just the mere designation by a thought consciousness on a basis of designation. So uh, 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 I, you know, 
in this case, the eye, this eye, you know, uh, that we see out of, uh, does not uh, exist in that way uh, um, uh, from its own side um, inherently. Uh, it, it requires this kind of thought designation on a basis uh, of an I, which is a collection, a collection and so forth. Um, but there is no I that can be found as separate from this kind of thought designation uh, on a basis of imputation. There's nothing, according to the Heart Sutra, the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, from the I's own side that makes it inherently exist as an I. Uh, just like there's nothing from the chairs, it's easier to do chairs sometimes, chairs on side that makes it inherently exist as a chair. The chair exists through mere thought designation on a basis, a collection, but that collection doesn't have any self character that can be established as chair from its own side. It's merely exists as chair when I label that basis of designation. And that labeling that's being done, that thought designation is enough, according to Nagarjuna, to say that that chair exists. But we don't say that the chair exists from its own side, that the chair exists right inside the object. We say that the chair is just, is just a name that I'm giving to a basis uh, that doesn't have chairness from its own side. It's merely just a basis. It's merely just a collection. It doesn't inherently possess these qualities uh, that are only chair uh, in terms of its parts, because we know there are pieces of it that could be made into other things. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, then it can't have an inherently existent parts. Then if there's not inherently existent parts, there can't be an inherently existent whole. Uh, and if we find that it requires this label part for there to be part, uh, we find that there's no inherently existent part because it's just mere thought designation. This mere thought designation is how the mode of existence of, of the chair. It's how the chair exists through mere thought designation. The chair doesn't exist from its own side. It's not able to stand itself up without that thought designation. It requires the subject in order for it to be chair. It doesn't have chair from its own side. Um, but the chair exists and, it, and according to Prasangika, the chair is external. It's not just the nature of our mind. It's not the same entity as our mind. Uh, it, it, it's something that is external. Um, so we have to investigate that and find out what that means. And then that's explicitly what the Heart Sutra is talking about, how appearances in reality don't seem to tally when we start to think about them. The way that things appear to have inherent existence from their own side and stand up alone uh, without our kind of subjectivity we come to find out it's all subjectivity uh, in terms of what we make the item into that is a basis. Uh, so, um, and then implicitly that this is talking about the five Mahayana paths that are necessary for us to traverse uh, to become a Buddha. Uh, so we've talked about a lot of this before, so we won't talk today more. Sutra of the Heart of Transcendent Knowledge. Thus have I heard once the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajagri at Vulture Peak Mountain together with the great gathering of the Sangha amongst a great gathering of the Sangha Bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi that expresses the Dharma called profound illumination. At the same time, noble Avagateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, while practicing the profound Prajaparamita, saw in this way, he saw the five skandhas to be empty of nature. Then through the power of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to noble Avagateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa, how should a son or daughter of noble family train who wishes to practice a profound Prajaparamita address in this way? Noble Avagateshvara, the Bodhisattva Mahasapa said to Venerable Shariputra, O Shariputra, a son or daughter of noble family who wishes to practice a profound Prajaparamita should see in this way, seeing the five skandhas to be empty of nature, form is emptiness, emptiness also is form, emptiness is no other than form, form is no other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Thus Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. There are no characteristics. There is no birth, no cessation. There is no impurity, no purity. There is no decrease, no increase. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, no dharmas, no eye, dot to no mind, dot to no dot to of dharmas, no mind, consciousness, dot to no ignorance, no end of ignorance, up to no old age and death, no end of old age and death, no suffering, no origin of suffering, no cessation of suffering, no path, no wisdom, no attainment, and no non attainment. Therefore, Shariputra, since the Bodhisattvas have no attainment, they abide by means of Prajaparamita. Since there is no obscuration of mind, there is no fear. They transcend falsity and attain complete nirvana. All the Buddhas of the three times by means of Prajaparamita fully awaken to unsurpassable, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the great mantra of Prajaparamita, the mantra of great insight, 
the unsurpassed mantra, the unequal mantra, the mantra that calms all suffering should be known as truth since there is no deception. The Prajaparamita mantra is said in this way. Thus, Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound Rajabhanamita. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised Noble Avakadeshavara, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, saying, Good, good, O oh, Son, Honorable Family, thus it is, O oh, Son, Honorable Family, thus it is. One should practice the profound Prajabhadamita just as you have taught, and all the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Venerable Shariputra, and Noble Avakadeshvara, Bodhisattva Mahasapa, that whole assembly in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, rejoiced and praised the words of the Blessed One. Make a mandala offering. The fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. Holy Lamas high, wrap the sky of your Dharma bodies in massive clouds of knowledge and love and let them pour upon the earth of your disciples as we are ready. A shower of rain, the teachings deep and wide. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious Guru. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Again, you all say the merit I create by listening to the Dharma. I'm teaching it. You're listening. So this is how you convert the prayers. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddhas, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Through the merit I create by teaching the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all sentient beings. Enthused by great compassion, you taught the Immaculate Dharma to dispel all perverted views. To you, the Buddha, Gautama, I pay homage. If you are attached to this life, you're not a spiritual practitioner. If you're attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you are attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there is grasping, you do not have the view. Okay, so nice to be here today to talk about this stuff, this stuff that really means so much to me. And for anyone uh, who's wondering the change of appearance, um, we used to have, you know, big picture up here of His Holiness, um, and it was not taken down out of any thing uh, other than respect for his holiness respect for my root teacher Kensar Geshe Wandak um, because Rinpoche said that the books need to be the highest thing in the room uh, and when he actually lived in this room he made me take all of the iconography and put it to the lower shelves and then when he passed and we do these teachings I thought oh we need this you know have these images and you know it was not sitting right in my mind um, so when something's not sitting right in your mind, uh, and it's just an instruction from your Lama, you just try to change it in whatever way, uh, really tallies with what the instructions are. Um, so this is why, so now we're looking at the medium scope section, uh, of Lama Sankapa's great treatise on the stage of the path to enlightenment. We've been led up to this incredible area. Uh, we've, we've learned about the lower realms of cyclic existence. We've gotten a taste of half of what we really don't want 
at all. Uh, I mean, that's for certain. Uh, if all of that stuff is true, I don't want anything to do with hot hells, cold hells, hungry ghosts, and the animal realm I can see is true. And that's really bad. I, I mean, that, that I don't want anything to do with that. So we get convinced about the drawbacks of the lower realms of cyclic existence in the in the small scope, the teaching share in common with beings of small capacity. Uh, we learn about the awfulness uh, that Arya Nagarjuna puts at the back, you know, where he describes everything. Uh, he describes all the realms in the in the seventh point in the sixth suffering part of the letter to a friend by Nagarjuna. And but in Sunkapa's text, because of the putting it in small, medium, and great scope. Uh, we have the presentation of half of what is the seventh thing in Nagarjuna's text at in the small scope before we get to these six sufferings. So if you're you know trying to kind of you know look at these two texts and understand how they relate, you know half of what the seventh point is is presented before the six sufferings by Lama Tsongkhapa in the small scope, where he goes over the lower realms of cyclic existence, uh, and then the higher realms of cyclic existence and the drawbacks of them are brought up in the medium scope because it is until the medium scope where you want to get rid of samsara altogether. It's the small scope where you're attached to this life, you're not a spiritual practitioner, where you start to you know get rid of attachment to this life uh, and you want to, you look at the downfalls of the lower realms uh, and then you definitely want to emerge from the lower realms of cyclic existence. But then when you get to the medium scope, the lower realms are distasteful, but the higher realms are as well. And it's explained why they're distasteful. Uh, and we're going through that process right now. And we're in the higher realms right now. We're a human in a higher realm. Uh, so we have a lot of empirical reality used as a resource for us to convince ourselves uh, that we want to not have to deal with this, <laughs> that we want to be free uh, from these things that are empirical realities. Uh, that are just so clearly empirical realities. So the small scope, we start to become a spiritual practitioner because we're looking at a future life. We're not just looking at this life because if we're just looking at this life and trying to be happy in this life, we are probably creating causes for the lower realms of cyclic existence. So this is why if we're only focused on this life and just getting pleasure now, why we're not a spiritual practitioner because we're creating causes for the lower realms of cyclic existence probably. Um, we're not we're not thinking about how our behavior needs to be modified so our future life uh, can be affected because you know this this current these experiences that we're having are really ripening from our previous actions and what we're doing now action wise is what's going to ripen into an experience so spiritual practitioners play that game smart play the long game <laughs> and see how okay. All this stuff that's happening now is from something I did before. Uh, and if it's good, it means I did something good before. If it's bad, I did something bad before. And now that I realize this is the way the system works, let me in the small scope try and fix the game in cyclic existence so that I have good cyclic existence. Then the medium scope comes around and this, you know, in Lamrim, you know, medium scope comes around and says, <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure that you want to be in cyclic existence at all, you know, whether you rig the game or not, you're going to experience among the three types of suffering. And the happiness that you think you're having in the desire realm that you're trying to rig towards is really suffering because it's the suffering of change. It will end in separation in some way. Somehow or another, you'll be separated in from, from that happiness in terms of intensity, or if it's a person in terms of them dying or in terms of them not liking you anymore. This thing doesn't have the stability you're looking for in terms of happiness. So you start to see that, yeah, you wanted to rig the game, you wanted to rig samsara, but now you're realizing that samsara is rigged. All, the whole thing's rigged. So you think you're rigging samsara, but samsara is rigged. There's no happiness to be found even in the higher realms of cyclic existence. So we say, oh, that's not true. Well, then you say, okay, I'm a human. We started with the eight sufferings, the suffering of birth. Okay, there's two beings who are really suffering at that moment, a mother, no question. 
you know, and the, the child. You look at the descriptions of being crushed and pushed out and then you don't know where you are. You know who anyone is and everything that's, you know, remotely cold is freezing, remotely hot is burning, you know, remotely, you know, not tender, feels like sandpaper. You, you know, you come out born, you know, you know, and, you know, depending on, you know, how you look at this, you could look at birth in the 12 links and look at the ejection, you know, into, you know, that's suffering too, because you just, you don't, you didn't have any kind of like say in the matter. You're suddenly like forced into this bardo, you know, many cases, intermediate state. And, you know, just imagine that, you know, you're in like a light body that you're not, you, you know, it's just, and you're going fast and you have aggregates that you think are yours. It's just very confusing. So no matter how you want to talk about birth, and this is talking about birth, birth, you know, birth, <laughs> birth from an egg, birth from a womb, miraculous birth, birth from heat and moisture, you know? So you have this birth, that's suffering. Then you have aging. This is suffering. Every moment your life's disintegrating. Every moment, every moment. And there may be an aging process where one could argue, well, you know, it's nice to age from like toddler to where at least you can talk in 10. Like, where is your aging like that you would like to have? You know, you have a lot more freedom when you don't know how to do stuff. <laughs> so like, you know, you want to age, you think you want to age, but, but the whole time this aging is taking place, you're moving closer and closer to death. So when we look at aging, don't just look at it as, oh, this momentary thing that's taking place. Look at it like, okay, well, what part of aging wouldn't be suffering? You know, you're current, you're, you're constantly moving, you know, towards something that is death, but there's this aging process that takes place the moment of conception, the moment of the ejection uh, from your last life. There's a, a, an aging that's taking place. There's a karma that's keeping you there. That's weakening. That's what the aging is, is the karma that's keeping you there is weakening to keep you there. Whatever that is, it's keep the karma that's keeping you a human in this place is weakening every moment. Arya Davis says, those moments are your enemies. Each of those moments are moments killing you more. <laughs> every moment you're having is just another moment that's just shucking it away at you, killing you. You know, looking at moments like this. So starting to, to understand this aging process that's happening. Birth, aging, sickness, death, separating from the pleasant, meeting with unpleasant, not getting what you want. The suffering of these forced on mind and body that has all this yuckiness about it. I mean, these are all empirical truths. The Buddha said, is there a problem? First truth is suffering. This is the superior truth of suffering. And then the Buddha said, suffering has to be identified. That's what we're doing. We're identifying it. We're doing what the Buddha said. There's four things to do. And the first one is you've got to identify something. <laughs> we're identifying it because we have to identify it for ourselves and then if we want to have love and compassion, we have to identify it so that we can see what others need to have a problem with. We want them to be free from suffering. We not, need to know what that suffering is. We won't even know their suffering. We see somebody, you know, driving down the road with their top down in their Lamborghini. They have those with top down. I think they do. I guess. They're driving, you know, they look so happy. You know, something's blowing in the breeze. Just music's cranking. I have to be able to see that as an immense amount of suffering. What? <laughs> I have to be able to relate to that as suffering if I want to have compassion for all sentient beings. If I want to say I want all sentient beings to be free from suffering and I want all sentient beings to have happiness, I have to have studied the first noble truth well enough to look at somebody in a Lamborghini with the top off on a beautiful sunny day, smiling ear to ear with the music cranking, and I have to be able to say, oh my gosh, this person is suffering. I have to be able to start to relate to the world in a totally different way. We think that Buddhism is just so simple to start to like, you know, navigate, be a little bit nicer and be a little bit more ethical. That's where we start. But when we start to look at the ramifications of the tenets and the views that we're putting, we have to start to look at everything so differently. And this is what it's all about. We start to be able to see. And then if I see 
the Lamborghini guy or gal, you know, as suffering, what does that make me? How does that make me relate to the Lamborghini differently? So you start to see how understanding what suffering is allows my, you know, relationship to objects well before I know they aren't inherently existent, become more realistic, become just more understanding that, hey, empirically, this thing, this thing's rusting, this thing's going to want to be traded in. There's, there's no way that that happiness that seems so happy could stay that way. And the Buddha's does. The Buddha stays happy. The smile ear to ear, that stays for the Buddha. But sooner or later, that Lamborghini is going to be last year's model. And I'm guessing, I'm guessing that there's going to be a craving for next year's model. And then all of a sudden, that thing that I've observed and they've observed as this object of happiness and this experience of happiness isn't that it isn't this static thing that has that value that i give it because it couldn't possibly have it because of impermanence because it doesn't have any nestness from its own side there's just so many reasons why i start to be able to become more realistic through changing my cognitive process through seeing things more realistically through understanding how things really are, through understanding that, you know, two well-made shoes, one is a million, you know, for $5,000, one is a thousand, you know, is $5. How does that shoe that costs so much more, but just gets me to like put it on and walk and come home, why does that have so much more value if it's both well-made shoe? Both well-made shoe. You know you can get a well-made shoe that's, you know, a thousandth of a cost of another well-made shoe. There's very expensive shoes out there. What is it that if they both perform the function and last durably as long, and I mean, these they, they couldn't have gone to the top of Mount Everest to get the leather, you know, it's so rare. It's because of, you know, what what's going on? Why is this one so much more than the other one? Why does my mind feel like it has to have this one over here? Why isn't it satisfied with the one over here? It's putting some sort of value that's making me suffer. And And even, you know, that car with the nice day and the smiling and all that, there's probably an upgrade even for that. Like, oh, Monday, <laughs> I got to get down to the dealership because there's an upgrade. Like even driving with a smiling, like, yeah, well, tomorrow I'll get the upgrade. <laughs> totally dissatisfied even in the moment. So this is how we start to just look at our lives and dissatisfaction and, and how this could be true if we think that these things are going to make us happy. How could they be dissatisfied? What's wrong? Are we mentally ill? And the Buddha would say, yeah, <laughs> totally mentally ill, <laughs> totally, totally mentally ill, cognitively impaired, cognitively just, you know, everything's appearing wrong. You're apprehending them wrong, you know, just really, really not well. But the beautiful thing is, is that not wellness isn't fixed. Here's the good part we can change this in this life we can change this kind of wrong idea by applying right knowledge and the four noble truths is the beginning of our journey into right knowledge about reality it's the first turning of the wheel of dharma the first thing the buddha says you know after he talks to indra and brahma and says i i retired into the woods because this stuff's too heavy for mankind after that, <laughs> then they're like, please, Buddha, go teach. They give him a conch and a wheel. And then Buddha teaches the first turning of the wheel of Dharma. And Sarnath Varnas. The first thing he says is, hey, you need to know about suffering. Why? Because it's something that we can convince ourselves we, we want out of. 
that there are drawbacks of because we don't have to look too far because it's our everyday experience. So the Buddha said, hey, this is your everyday experience. Don't take my word for it. Familiarize yourself with what I said. So know what I said and then analyze it. So hear what I said and then analyze it and see if you discover what I discovered about it. See if you discover that birth is suffering. See if you discover what I discovered about aging, sickness, and death. This is what it means by discovering what the Buddha discovered. The Buddha doesn't have this special package that you'll never know about and that you just have to somehow say some mantras and Buddha's going to hit you in the head with a stick. No, this is something you're going to discover when you do what the Buddha said. The truth of suffering has to be identified. Identify it, and you'll discover what the Buddha discovered. <laughs> you know, you, you, you'll discover exactly what the Buddha discovered. You, you don't have to think like, oh, you know, how could I ever have this great realization? You'll discover it, just like Buddha. That's how. But first, you have to know kind of what are some of the things. What are these drawbacks? What are what are, what is it that should motivate me enough to find out how to stop it? And that's these different types of suffering we study. So now we're looking at the six types of suffering and the fault of uncertainty uh, we already went over, that we have no certainty in terms of our rebirth. We aren't going to stick with our friends and family and our enemies aren't going to be, oh, there they are again. Oh, you nemesis. No, they may be our wife or husband or child. Uh, so we have this uncertainty, this kind of like chaos. <laughs> when we think of cyclic existence, it seems very orderly in our lives. Like you fit into this role, you fit into this role and you fit into this role. But then when we spread it out to the real reality, because our consciousness is beginningless and endless. So it's the, our consciousness. It isn't some other separate consciousness. It's not like this consciousness breaks, a new one starts somehow from the elements and then there's a different person. So it's a continuum uh, of consciousness. Uh, that's going on. This continuation uh, is is something that that we then, when we analyze, see the ramifications of. And the ramifications are the chaos of relationships, the chaos. You know, nothing that we hold as solid is what it's going to be or what it will be. Maybe in an hour or two hours. You know, who knows. You know, how quickly, how many relatives have we had or how many loved ones have we had that we don't know anymore? And like the last class that have passed away. Now, think about this. Maybe it was a few years ago. How long does it take for a cow to mature? Are you drinking your mother's milk again? We have to think like this. Are you eating your best friend who died in a car accident? Have you fished them out of the sea? We have to think like this. This is how we start to not harm beings and connect with more and more beings and love more beings by seeing the beings that, like Pabunka Rinpoche says, you come on an ant and say, my dear mother. This is how we do it. We make this real in our lives. And this chaos shows us that the way we stick on people as fixed relationships isn't right. So this is the fault of uncertainty. The fault of insatiability is that we're never satisfied. And we we read through this part that uh, you know where it says we've drank you know more milk than could fill all four oceans. You know, drinking from our mothers, and we'll drink more uh, unless if we remain as ordinary beings. If we don't see emptiness directly, one hundred percent we get more samsara. You know that I mean, just tons of it. Seeing emptiness directly starts to stop it. It doesn't stop it altogether. You got to see emptiness a bunch of times. Long story. Get rid of subtler and subtler problems. Um, but it starts to stop it. It doesn't start getting stopped until you see emptiness. So you better see emptiness, right? Samsara doesn't start getting stopped until you see emptiness. So if the only way to freedom is to see emptiness, as Shanti Davis says, you better get cracking. There's nothing else to do. What else is there to do, folks? So... So if you're ne you're never satisfied, and then the letter friendly letter it says just as a leper tormented by maggots turns to fire for relief but finds no peace, so should you understand attachment to sensual uh, pleasures. It's kind of like uh, 
you know, if you have, this is kind of a hard, just hard one because we don't really have this frame of reference as much, uh, but it's turning to something that's suffering for relief. You know, scratching an itch over and over and over again, you know, to the point where it hurts. You ever do that when you have a bug bite and you make it hurt, you put an X in it. <laughs> but wouldn't it be better not to have a bug bite at all, is what Nagarjuna would say. Uh, so you're not going, he says, in the compendium of perfections, it says you get what you want, use it up, then acquire more, and still you're not satisfied. What could be sicker than this? Chandra Groman's letter to his students says, what being has not come into the world hundreds of times? What pleasure has not already been experienced countless times? What luxury, such as splendid, splendid white yak tail fans, have they not owned? Yet even when they possess something, their attachment grow, continues to grow. There is su no suffering they have not experienced many times, and things they desire do not satisfy them. There is no living being that has not slept in their bellies. So why do they not rid themselves of attachment to cyclic existence? Think about this. No, I'm just going to read. Furthermore, you will become very disenchanted with cyclic existence if you reflect on what the alleviating sorrow uh, uh, says. The soka vinodana. Soka vinodana. Again and again in hells, you drank boiling liquid copper, so much that even the water in the ocean does not compare. The filth you have eaten as a dog and as a pig would make a pile far more vast than Meru, the king of the mountains. On account of losing loved ones and friends, you have shed so many tears in the realms of cyclic existence that the ocean couldn't contain them. The heads that have been severed from fighting one another, if piled up, would reach beyond Brahma's heaven. You have been a worm, and having been ravenous, you ate so much sludge that if were poured into the great ocean, it would completely fill it. And then the Array of Stock Sutra says, remember the infinite bodies which in the past you wasted senselessly on account of desire. Now in this life, truly seek enlightenment. Take up disciplined conduct and thereby destroy desire. Remember the infinite bodies which in the past you wasted senselessly on account of desire. As many times as there are grains of sand in the Ganges, you failed to please the Buddhas and ignored their teachings such as this. Even if you granted the vast wonders of cyclic existence, if you gained the vast wonders of cyclic existence, they would be illusory. Bear in mind that countless bodies you have wasted in the past, experiencing limitless and pointless suffering. Consider that it will continue this way unless you make an effort to put an end to it. Develop a sense of disenchantment, Jingawa said. Honorable teachers, how many bodies have you taken from beginningless time? Now, since you never practice Mahayana teachings, you must apply yourselves assiduously. Sampua says, in this cyclic existence, there are many turns for fortunate of, of fortune for better or for worse. Do not stake your hopes on them. Reflect until you give rise to this kind of thinking. After you have developed it, you must continually sustain it in meditation. Okay, so here the point of this section is, is it, it moves into, you know, you're never satisfied uh, and you've, your whole, all of your lives just chased after desirous things and wasted opportunities. So this is where it leads into, it starts out as you're never satisfied. And because of your dissatisfaction, you've just kind of waste your time in every single life. You don't do what's going to cause you to get satisfied. <laughs> you do more and more of what causes dissatisfaction. So this is totally illogical. So what would cause satisfaction? This is what we're talked about it earlier in the teaching. You know, what's logic doing things which cause satisfaction? Stop wasting your opportunity like you always have. Why have you always wasted it? Because you've chased it after things. Why did you chase after things? Because you're never satisfied. Why are you never satisfied? Well, there's no satisfaction in cyclic existence. So, so this is what you start to analyze and you don't just do it once. And when you become convinced of it, you don't say, okay, now I can move on. You continually remind yourself of this because no one else believes this. 
and everyone else around you is going to say, you know, one life to live, go for it, you know, find your happiness in the moment only. And that may start to appeal to you if you haven't analyzed this over and over again. And if you don't continue to analyze this, you know, we look at Lama Tsongkhapa's first plea, you know, that he makes after the teacher. And it, it's to, to make use of this life of leisure. I found just once, ever so hard to find, ever so valuable. May I take its essence night and day. Normally, we've been unsatisfied and chasing after things and not taking life's essence because of this distraction, because of our being overwhelmed by the splendors of cyclic existence. But now we recognize that they aren't splendors because we've identified this second truth and the truth of suffering that they'll never satisfy us. This, this, this second truth and the six sufferings within the first noble truth of suffering, we've realized that they're not satisfying. We recognize this. So then we start to say, well, what is? What is satisfying? How can I be satisfied? And then we start to take the essence of this life because we recognize that, okay, over and over again, I've wasted this. So I probably have had this opportunity before and wasted it. I've met with the Dharma before. I'm here. I'm talking Dharma. I must have met with the Dharma before, but I don't have it. I don't have it completely. So there's something that I wasted somewhere. Had to have wasted it somewhere. Um, in the past. So here now, I'm saying, please bless me to not waste it. As you know, begging for a mountain of blessings, as Pabunka Rinpoche says about the foundation of all good qualities, please bless me to see that this stuff is so dissatisfying because of my analysis of it and my understanding that I need to take the essence of this life. And the way that I do that is by engaging in the practices of beings of three capacities. And that's the brochures that Lama Tsongkhapa hands out, you know, to us to find out here, this is what you could do, you know, with a life. These are the things that you could could do with the human life of leisure and, 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 and you could practice. And this is what would really cause you to have varying forms of more reliable happiness to the point of complete reliable happiness. You know, the small scope isn't reliable happiness because you go to the higher realms. The medium scope isn't the most reliable happiness because you, you don't have bliss yet. You only have, you know, an abiding nirvana and you still have subtle self-cherishing attitude. Subtle self-cherishing blocks bliss, blocks reliability, blocks omniscience, blocks perfect wisdom, love and compassion and skillful means. So we meditate on these things to generate realistic kind of thoughts in our mind that tally with the way things really are. So we stop exaggerating things. And when we stop exaggerating things, they can't cause us to suffer the same way. And then we stop exaggerating things at the level of real reality. And that's in terms of thinking they have inherent existence. But they don't even have kind of the quality, regular quality. Forget the emptiness part that we think that they do. Um, and we can convince ourselves of that well before we kind of get to emptiness. Um, and the next one is short. So I'm going to finish with three the fault of casting off bodies repeatedly. And the friendly letter says, each of us has left a pile of bones that would dwarf Mount Meru. Anyone who's new, there's this Mount Meru in the Abhidharma teachings and the Buddhist teachings. It's this king of mountains. It's higher than anything in the universe. Science can't find it. Dalai Lama says, okay, we have to kind of go with science, but then there's other things science can't see. So we just leave it at that. But it just means like the highest peak in the world, higher than Mount Everest, like, you know, so just imagine the highest thing there is and that the amount of bones you've shucked off in previous lives would be higher than that. Because we think this is it. We don't think much about, you know, like more than here. <laughs> we think about these bones. But in a previous life, this consciousness has been in other bones that we shucked off to get here. And we'll get to our future life by shucking off these bones. So we've just been professional shuckers and we will stay professional shuckers if we don't see emptiness. <laughs> so we think these bones are our bones, but we thought all those, that mountain of bones was us. 
I mean, how many beings can you put together? How many separate beings <laughs> can you put together if you have a pile of bones higher than Mount Everest? How many separate beings can you put together? Those separate beings that you can put together, I believe were me and I shucked off. Weird, right? <laughs> <laughs> for each living being if the bones discarded upon taking up new bodies did not disappear they would tower over even mount meru we meditate on this meditate on our bones coming together and then shucking off meditating on oh imagine we were a goat before before imagining it and those bones shuck off you know we have little goat bones in the pile, human bones in the pile, you know, whatever. Whatever has bones. I started to go to invertebrate. I realized I was making an error. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> you get the point. These are the meditations that we do, folks. We meditate on this. Oh, these bones, piles of bones. These are Bones I thought were my bones. Are these bones my bones? Who is my? Why do I think that this is me inherently? These are my bones. Why do I think that this mine owns bones? Do I think that the bones in the cemetery that I go to and see died before 1972 could be my bones? When you're at a cemetery, oh, look, this is a really old cemetery. It's really a historic Confederate cemetery. Imagine all the wars and battles. No, imagine those are your bones. Just like when Buddha brought the stoop out and showed the, told the story of the tigress and said, no, you know whose bones those are? My bones in a previous life. This is what we do. We make our lives real with reality. Those could be my bones. That's my mother over there in the garden more like this, maybe, or my mother's mother. My mother hasn't passed, so I'm just saying like, you know, in terms of this life, and then we go broad and it just becomes, there is no being I'm not connected to in very, very intimate ways. Okay, and we just keep shucking them off, shucking them off. When are we gonna shuck this one off? When will this pile of bones just be a pile of bones and the rest of the pile of bones? Do all those pile of bones mean anything to you right now? Do you feel they're so important? You did. You felt the same eye. The eye travels. Final view, shocker, the eye. What travels eye? Eye, eye, whoever eye is then, whoever you are. I'm this now and I'm designated on these aggregates. The eye was designated on those bones. Then you start to say, Wait, why do these bones get so much more value than the other ones? That's Buddhism. <laughs> Sometimes you start to hear Buddhism in other places. You're like, I don't know if I even study Buddhism. And then you look at the authentic text and say, yeah, yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> I do study Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> if you're attached to this life, you're not a spiritual practitioner. If you're attached to samsara, you have no renunciation. If you're attached to your own self-interest, you have no bodhicitta. If there's grasping, you do not have the view. Prayer for the flourishing of Lama Tsongkhapa's teachings. Thank you, Lama Tsongkhapa, so much. So, so much for traveling around with all those yaks with books on them so that I can have some kind of a clue what this stuff means. And thank you for telling people who told people, who told people, who told Kensa Rinpoche, who told His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who told Geshe Dorje Damdu, who told Geshe Humsla Geshe Aga, who told Ge Geshe Lob Sangonpo. This is it. This is why we can rely on this. Because Lama Tsongkhapa told us. Because if it's not what Lama Tsongkhapa said, it's broken in the lineage. It's got a tally, and we see that it does, and it's just so refreshing. Prayer of Flourishing of Lama Tsongkhapa's teachings, the Lozong Yatema. 
Though he's the father producer of all conquerors as a conqueror's song, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma in infinite worlds through this truth may the conqueror of those teachings flourish. When in the presence of Buddha Indraketu, he made his vow, the conqueror and his offspring praised his powerful courage. Through this truth, may the conqueror of Lozong's teachings flourish. That the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread, he offered a white crystal rosary to the sage who gave him a conscience prophesied. Through this truth, may the conqueror of Lozong's teachings flourish. His pure view free of eternity or destruction, his pure meditation cleanse of dark baiting and fog, his pure conduct practiced according to the conqueror's orders, may the conqueror of Lozong's teachings flourish. Learn it since he extensively sought out learning, reverent, rightly applying it to himself. Good, dedicating all for beings and doctrines, may the conqueror of Lozong's teachings teachings flourish through being sure that all scriptures definitive and interpretive were without contradiction advice for one person's practice he stopped all misconduct may all the conqueror of lozong's teachings flourish listening to the explanations of the three pitakas realized teachings practice of the three trainings his skilled and accomplished life story is amazing may the conqueror of lozong's teachings flourish outwardly calm and subdued by the hearer's conduct and really trusting in the two stages of practice he allied without clash the good paths of sutra and tantra may the conqueror of lozong's teachings flourish combining voidness explained as a causal vehicle with great bliss achieved by method the vehicle hard essence of eighty thousand dharma bundles may the conqueror lozong's teachings flourish by the power of the ocean of oath-bound doctrine protectors like the main guardians of the three beings paths the quick acting lord vaishravana karmayana may the conqueror lozong's teachings flourish in short by the lasting of glorious guru's lives by the earth being full of good learned reverend holders of the teaching and by the increase of the power of its patrons may the conqueror lozong's teachings flourish so we one last point how do we know if a buddha if it's a Buddhist teaching, according to view, uh, and the way that we know if it's a Buddhist teaching, according to view, is if it has within it the four seals. The seals kind of puts tape around the Buddhist teaching. All you know, uh, all composite things are impermanent. All contaminated thing, contaminated things are in the nature of suffering. All phenomena are in the nature of emptiness and selflessness. Transcending sorrow is peace. Uh, and when we look at that third. Uh, all phenomena are in the nature of emptiness and selflessness. Even the lowest Vaibhashika school who asserts a true self. Yeah, I know. <laughs> who asserts a true self. They they say that that self has, is a, an autonomous, substantial self, but it is not permanent, unitary, or independent. Um, so we, we can see that at the least, they have to assert uh, the selflessness of a uh, um, permanent, unitary, independent uh, self of person and as far as who's a buddhist it's those who who some say go for refuge to the buddha dharma and the sangha uh and others would say uh those who is, would would say that yes that the buddha says is exactly true uh 100 percent, and has faith in in conviction in the four noble truths and the second turning of the wheel of dharma etc cetera, etc cetera. and the reason for that real quick is Buddha a Buddhist? Buddha doesn't need to go for refuge. Buddha doesn't have fear and faith. But Buddha should be a Buddhist uh, because Buddha agrees with that this is the reality um, and has faith in that reality, is a belief in that, directly knows that reality. So it's a debate. Some people say Buddha is not a Buddhist, but I throw some controversy in for fun. Concluding mandala offering and dedication prayer. <laughs> you figure out, Buddha a Buddhist or not? <sighs> the fundamental ground is scented with incense and strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this is a Buddha land and offer it. May all sentient beings enjoy this pure realm. I dedicate whatever virtues I've collected for the benefit of the teachings of all sentient beings, in particular for the essential teachings of Venerable Lizan, drop it to shine forever. I send forth this jeweled mandala to you, precious guru. Any mistakes that I've made, I apologize. And may they be purified by this mantra of Vajrasapa, imagining Vajrasapa in the space in front of us, inseparable from our uh, root lama. And imagine that white, uh, that light rays and nectars are showering down on us and all sentient beings, transforming into white ohms, red oz, blue homes. Uh, and purifying ours and all sentient beings, body, speech, and mind, respectively. Om benza sata samaya mena balaya benza sata zena bhaji tati yata meva vazu tukaya meva vazu bukaya meva anuragi meva vazu avasini meva vrachi sapa kama sujimei kitam shriyam kuru hum ha 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 ho bhagavan sava tata kata penza mahamu penza bhava maha samaya sapa ah hum vei. 
May we always be protected by Paul and Lama. Jara Rama 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 Rama Jara Rama Jara Rama Jara Rama Jara Rama Jara Rama Rama Jara 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 Rama Om Vajrapani Hari Griva Garuda Om Veg. I dedicate all this virtue to emulate the knowledge of the hero Manjushri and likewise Samantabhadra as well. With whatever dedication is praised is supreme by all the conquerors who traverse the three times, I also dedicate all my roots of virtue for the sake of auspicious deeds. In that pure land surrounded by snowy mountains, you are the source of all benefit and happiness. All powerful, Abhagateshvara, Tenzin Yatso, may you stay until some sorrows end. And a prayer of supplication to Namjo Kinsu Geshe Wandak Rinpoche that I wrote on March 6, 2023. A complex yogi poses as a simple monk. Homage to Kensu Geshe Wandak Rinpoche, our precious spiritual friend who is inseparable from Aryatara. I fully prostrate, covering as many atoms of the earth as possible to your pure body, speech, mind, and enlightened activities. I offer to you drinking water, bathing water, flowers, incense, candles, scented water, food, and music purified by Om Ma Om, Om Ma Om, Om Ma Om. The rarity of having one million wish-fulfilling gems is a common occurrence compared to meeting with a holy teacher like you who placed the complete path of Buddhahood in our childlike hands. Just like Atisha, who came to Tibet with a lamp to dispel the darkness of ignorance, you kind abbot arrived in the West with a lineage purer than a diamond and begged us never to be satisfied with partial instructions. Teachings of the extensive deeds and profound view lineages flowed from your lips like nectar for our ears that elucidated the teachings for beings of three capacities. Now that sound has stopped. All composite things are impermanent. You told us that all your teachers passed away and understood the sadness, entreating us to continue our studies. The Buddha does not wash away the negativities of beings, nor does he remove their miseries by his hands. The spiritual realizations are not transferred to them. It is by teaching the truth of suchness that beings are liberated. We are not prepared to take this difficult journey to the highest goodness of Buddhahood without your continued guidance. The sadness in our hearts would be too overwhelming. May you swiftly return to the world and take care of us in all our lives, wherever we may be, never leaving our hearts and crowns. May all sentient beings perfectly realize renunciation, bodhicitta, and the correct view of emptiness so they know who you really are. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share the Dharma with you, and I hope your mind becomes more and more virtuous by taking advantage of the moments that we have uh, now, because you don't know how many more you have in this basis with this Dharma, with this connection, with these teachers. And if you die in two weeks, hopefully you spent two weeks really preparing for that to happen. Thank you.